Hello and thank you to everyone for taking time to attend this learning exchange. Uh, I'd also like to thank ASPE and the Institute for Research on Poverty for hosting the event. The topic of virtual case management and human services delivery is obviously very timely. As Jennifer said, my name is Joe, Joe Raymond, and I work at ICF. Um, I've been with ICF for about five years, but have also spent over 25 years as a state and local human services executive. And so, I, again, I think this is, topic is very important given what's going on out in communities all across our nation. Our agenda is really straightforward today. We're going to have two presentations, a few polling questions and a question and answer period at the end. And you can submit questions uh, throughout the uh, presentation, and we might get to some of them during the presentations. I'd like to uh, introduce quickly a little bit in more detail our two presenters. First up will be Dr. Lauren Supli, and second will be uh, Ms. Jerry Cotter. Uh, Lauren is the Deputy Chief Operating Officer and Senior Scholar in Early Childhood Research at Child Trends. Prior to joining Child Trends, Lauren worked for the Federal Administration for Children and Families in the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation for 10 years. Jerry Cotter is a project manager at the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. Jerry manages the Comprehensive Case Management and Employment Program for the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services Office of Workforce Development. Um, I, again, I think it's important to acknowledge the tens of thousands of human services professionals who are now adjusting to working in a virtual environment uh, across health and child protection, adult protection, uh, housing, workforce, et cetera, I think what they do is remarkable. I still have, as we all do, many friends and colleagues who are uh, working on the front lines, and so I'm very excited about this topic. As we listen to, to uh, Lauren's presentation to start with, some of which is in context to telehealth, I uh, wonder if it's appropriate to consider a couple of questions, and so maybe we can talk about these in more detail, but I'm very curious about the emer these emerging innovations in virtual case management and how they might become a standard of practice uh, in the future and how could they be maintained and more easily implemented. It, it strikes me that uh, COVID-19 is this the uh, uh, most recent example of uh, challenges we're gonna be facing. We see this in the Virgin Islands now and other places as hurricanes and storms and the ability to actually provide services in a virtual environment could be very helpful. Secondly, that leads us to what is the potential role that the federal government can play to encourage learning and innovation at the state and local levels, and I hope we get a chance to talk about that. So uh, with that, Lauren, I'm going to turn this over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Joe, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about what we know uh, from research on telehealth um, and what that might mean for virtual uh, human service delivery. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just, you know, what is telehuman services and then talk about some of the key challenges that might be emerging in the field and what the existing research can tell about us about them. Um, so I, you know, I've been introduced already, um, but I want to just put a disclaimer on my background and expertise to say I am not an expert in telehealth. Um, I instead um, really reviewed the empirical literature, primarily randomized control trials that is out, are out there about um, parenting programs to inform my expertise area, which is in home visiting and the home visiting programs that have had to rapidly move to a telehealth model. Um, there are lots of technical assistance resources popping up all over the place um, in the field to support the field, um, but I wanted to get information out there about how research could inform those technical resources. Um, so we're going to start with a couple of polling questions to just get a sense of uh, people's experience with telehealth or telehuman services. Um, both practice and research. So if you look in the bottom of your screen, you should see a, a polling question, if you don't mind filling that out. All right, 
Well, answers are still coming in, but the pattern seems pretty clear that lots of attendees have experienced telehealth or telehuman services themselves, um, but many fewer have conducted research on telehealth or telehuman services. So hopefully the information presented here today will give you new insights into those um, um, materials and that experience. So uh, because telehuman services is very new, um, I really wanted to borrow from what we know about telehealth. Um, and there are definitions that vary across health and human services, but generally it includes the provision of support and services, um, including care and education, screening and diagnostic. And you know, some people think of telehealth and they think immediately of video conferencing, but it really does include also texting or online information or a combination of these services. Um, and I believe that this definition is very similar to what, how we can think about telehuman services. So there's um, much more research in the health and behavioral health field around this topic and very, very little on human services. As I mentioned, I really drew from parenting programs, um, some early intervention services, and some of the work uh, trying to reach remote families, such as the use of telehealth in tribal communities to inform this presentation and a related blog that I did earlier this year. So uh, in my work in home visiting, I'm part of the Home Visiting Applied Research Collaborative Leadership Team, which is a cooperative agreement from HRSA. And um, one of the aspects of that grant allows us to do rapid fire, what we call heartbeat surveys of the field to just get a sense of what's going on. And so we actually did one last week, and we're um, really pleased to see we got over 1,300 responses from home visiting programs across the country about what's going on in the field. And you can see that most local home visiting programs are using multiple modalities. So the IVC, or interactive video conferencing, telephone, or texting-based. Um, and about half of the local programs are using text messages, and nearly all of them are using phone calls and um, at least and video conferencing on, on a limited basis. Um, but you can see that you know, home visiting has made a rapid shift to the use of these telehealth or telehuman service modalities. So I'm now going to pivot into some of the challenges that might be happening and what research might be able to tell us about those challenges. Um, but before I do that, I think we have another poll about um, what folks think about the effectiveness of telehuman services. Do you believe they are more effective, less effective, or about the same as in-person services? Okay, so there's some more answers coming in, but the pattern, again, seems pretty consistent. Uh, there's a few people who think they are more effective, um, and then a few more, maybe about just over a third, or I think they're about the same in effectiveness. And then a lot of people think they are less effective than in-person services. So um, now I'm going to share what we do know about them. So. Most of the research that's been done in the use of these uh, telehealth-like platforms for human services or parenting programs um, is comparative effectiveness, so really comparing that platform to uh, in-person services or uh, to see if they're better or non-inferiority trials, which means they're saying, are they at least, at least equally the same? And pretty consistently, the impacts um, of the various options are found to be the same or better than in-person services. Uh, service delivery, which um, may be surprising to some of you. So around the effectiveness, um, this includes the use of interactive video visits. Um, so for example, and many of these examples, I should say, are, are considered evidence-based parenting programs. So uh, in the parent-child interaction therapy, um, internet video-based uh, services were found to be as effective for some outcomes and actually more effective for other outcomes as in-person clinic-based clinic implementation. Um, adding texting support to in-person home visits um, 
was found to improve uh, both parent engagement and attendance at those in-person visits. Um, so for example, there was a randomized trial adding texting to SafeCare's home visiting programs and found that parents were more apt to apply the content that they were learning and more engaged with the content that they were learning in the sessions. And then um, online content, particularly when adding coaching. So uh, the uh, parenting program Triple P, which is a child abuse prevention program, found they actually had improved child and parent outcomes compared to in-person uh, groups when they added the online content. But importantly, they found the addition of a phone-based consultation to the online services actually led to stronger gains. Um, and it's important to notice when, throughout this presentation is how core components of these evidence-based programs, you know, we have to make sure we're still adhering to those. And in uh, an adaptation of the Incredible Years Parenting Program, initially they did not have a coaching component and found that because uh, role play was an important core component of their program, that until they added that live coaching to the online content, they actually weren't achieving the same effects and that wasn't really being achieved with fidelity. But once they added that, they actually found similar outcomes. Um, we also see a little bit of evidence, very thin, but a little bit that they might be more cost effective for some communities, such as reaching veterans, remote families, and tribal communities. And that's because if the uh, effectiveness is equivalent or better, but we have reduced travel time or reduced child care without decreasing quality or reducing some of the barriers for these services, that they may end up being more cost effective in the end. So I'm now going to pivot to uh, engagement, and there is a consistent finding across all of these of higher parent engagement with virtual services. Um, so as I mentioned, that other study adding text messages to in-person visits actually led to higher parent engagement with the content and with their provider. If uh, There's research finding higher parent satisfaction with virtual home visits. Um, so there was a pilot study of the use of parents as teachers, which is a home visiting program focused on school readiness. and um, they found that while parents were enrolled in services in a shorter period of time, the time that they were enrolled was more intensive. So they were actually showing up for more visits and were engaged for longer on those visits than in their, their um, typical home-based op options. Um, and then we find high rates of rapport with the home visitor, particularly if there's options for interacting with the home visitor in between sessions um, using things like texting or chat. Um, there's a lot of questions out right now about how to do screening in this virtual environment, and I will say that much of the resources out there I see um, now are, you know, really uh, not necessarily, there's not a lot of research on it to, to support what's out there. Um, there, the one study I have seen that looked at this was um, that pilot of telehome visiting and parents as teachers, and they did report that they were able to do developmental screenings of children um, virtually, and they, they suggested in interviews that it actually increased parents' empowerment because the parents themselves had to really report back to the home visitor about how their child was doing, as well as, you know, about their own mental health, and it wasn't based as much on the home visitor doing that observation, um, but they did also also find that parents really needed clarity on the purpose of the screener and the value of it uh, so that they knew sort of what they were doing, why they were doing it, and how they should be doing it. Um, there was a large systematic review in the telehealth field um, and generally also concluded even in the telehealth field that there is very little research right now on screening and assessment and most of it is focused really on the treatment aspect. So this uh, snapshot is also from that heartbeat that I mentioned that was uh, taken about a week ago. Um, and you can see uh, related to screening here that there were certainly some issues of confidentiality that popped up that home visitors were concerned about, um, particularly related to things uh, around screening and whether that confidentiality could be attained in the home visits and people were able to share the information they needed for screening for sensitive topics such as intimate partner violence or depression. There's very limited research on implementation of sort of like, how do you do this well? Most of the uh, materials that are available, primarily again in the telehealth field, focus on financial reimbursement, policy, or technology requirements. Much less is known about how do we build rapport, coaching strategies, effective means for conveying information. Um, there, there is some anecdotal evidence from some 
researchers starting to study this, sharing that they felt that in some ways it actually improved uh, in, in home visiting, improved the ability of the home visitor uh, to convey information because they really had to build their coaching skills versus sort of just showing the parent how to do it. They had to really articulate how they needed it to be done. Uh, but that's very, very limited, and that was really sort of one researcher telling me um, about her own research. Um, so there is information, as I mentioned, about sort of the context, um, you know, really emphasizing the importance of lighting. Uh, and a lot of this also is out of the telehealth field so that you can see the facial expressions or see sort of, you know, the color of someone's skin to maybe do in a diagnostic. But you could imagine the same would be applied in human services about wanting to make, you know, eye contact and ensuring that you can see whether someone, you know, is uncomfortable in, with a particular question and, and be able to sort of um, probe and support families in that. Um, there's lots of uh, talk about sort of the importance of camera placement and minimizing distractions, both visual and auditory. Um, so they suggested that like, providers choosing sort of a neutral background. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, trying to also set boundaries. So, you know, because uh, these modalities, you know, don't have a typical nine to five um, office environment at helping and um, supporting staff and how to set appropriate boundaries of when and how clients might reach out to them was really important. Um, so, I mentioned a little bit about rapport. There was one study of telebehavioral health in veterans affairs, and they found that therapists noted that they were um, concerned that they weren't able to see sort of physical markers of stress, so fidgeting hands or feet, uh, or not being able to tell if the client was crying or if that sniffle was because they had a cold or that they were upset. Uh, but they did say that they still were able to build strong rapport with their clients, but there were just some things that they found that they had to overcome um, in that um, telehealth environment. Um, so privacy is a big topic that comes up related to these uh, telehuman services and telehealth um, platforms, and it is a concern for both providers and clients. So first, you know, there's a lot of information about the selection of platforms, um, and that was particularly something that providers raised, and I know that um, Health and Human Services has recently put out some guidance on HIPAA-compliant platforms, uh, but really think, you know, supporting staff to be able to, and programs to pick the right platform. Um, in the home visiting sort of telehealth uh, studies, the families reported preferring telehealth options because it actually increased their confidentiality so that they didn't have sort of neighbors or friends knowing they were going to seek services, they could get them in the privacy of their own home. Um, but on the flip side, both providers and clients have shared concerns about who else might be listening on the other side. So providers not sure if they're, say, screening for uh, intimate partner violence, whether the you know, potential uh, member of the family of concern was right off camera and they didn't know. But clients in this VA study also reported not knowing if there was someone in the provider's home that was able to hear the session. So it's important, I think, to, uh, to you know, think about these and discuss them openly on both ends. Um, there is very little research on the workforce skills and training needed to do this well um, and sort of how to do supervision well or, you know, support staff well remotely. Um, there was uh, one study that pointed to the need for home visitors to really build their coaching and facilitation and active listening skills more so even than in person because some of those regular cues weren't available on both the provider and the client side, uh, but we know very little right now about this. However, there is evidence that the workforce actually really likes these options. Um, so um, in the, after some of these pilot studies have ended, they talked to the workforce about how it went and found that um, many of them would uh, opt to continue to use these options. They found it was easier to fit into their schedule. Um, they found an easier connection with their parents they were providing and improved engagement. Um, and, you know, when asked, it was, um, they found that like 85% of providers said they would continue to, to use it to confirm appointments. 81% um, said that they uh, would use it as a tool to build a relationship with parents, um, and they, they found that it really um, was useful in sort of connecting and communicating um, in multiple platforms. 
So I'm going to end with just, um, you know, where should we be going now? So, you know, there was a question raised, what should we be measuring now? Um, and I do think we have an opportunity to do two things. So one is really starting to study this implementation and, and at least just documenting what are the successes and challenges going on right now so that will help inform future research. Uh, but equally, are there databases or data sets that we could have prior to COVID and immediately after COVID that are collecting many of the same either outcomes or outputs um, or implementation information that will help us see how things have changed uh, when programs have, have moved to a telehealth or a telehealth services option very quickly. I think um, my background in that, you know, home visiting space is in part using precision medicine and precision public health and applying it to human services. Um, so that naturally leads me to ask the question, you know, sort of what services for whom and under what conditions. So there, again, there's some anecdotal information to share that there are some parents that really like this option and some parents that don't. But how, we don't know a lot about who uh, prefers it, who does not, and how do we then tailor services to what families need and when they need it. Um, as I mentioned, the sort of studying the implementation successes and challenges, you know, how do you build rapport, um, what are the sort of more getting under it more than technology necessarily. Um, and what are the workforce needs and skills to, um, to build these, uh, the workforce to be able to use these tele-service uh, options. Um, I do think we need to, particularly for evidence-based programs, understand, you know, how do you maintain those core components uh, and, you know, offer services with fidelity in this tele-option. Um, and I think that's really thinking about kind of what actually makes services effective and how do you then offer that same effectiveness within this tele-option. I know with the parents as teachers and pilots, they spent a lot of time thinking about how the rapport between a provider and a parent is critical as a core component, and then thinking how do they build that rapport and then how would that look in a tele environment so I think we need to do a lot of deep thinking about that uh, we need a lot more research on effective screening and referral. Uh, I know programs are really struggling with this and trying to, to figure it out on the fly, and we need to find ways to, to support them and find out what works. And particularly, that also includes not only the actual conducting of the screening, but then once parents have the results, um, what do they do with them? And I think that's both in the, tel in the COVID situation now, given what's happened to the human services system, and then post-COVID, um, how do you think about if you continue to use this modality to move motivate parents to complete that referral. Um, and then, as I mentioned already, this sort of new research leveraging existing data um, to understand this as like a natural experiment and, and understand how it's different than the services you're providing just a few months ago. Um, so I hope that was presentation was helpful, and I'll turn it back over to Joe. Thank you, Lauren. That was very helpful, and I think it raises a lot of uh, interesting potentials and uh, there's a question we have we're going to get to in a second about the ever-present issue of privacy and confidentiality but I want to ask you or Jerry have you come across any research or examples um, of mobile technology being used to uh, mobile phones we know that the quote-unquote younger generation the Millennials particularly and others are um, you know very comfortable with it with that technology and as you talked about texting and proactive, what I would see is proactive communication with customers. Uh, an awful lot of case management has to do with minimizing churn and being effective in communication for recertifications of eligibility for case changes across any program you can virtually think of. And it takes a ton of time to deal with walking in people. And so have you got any thoughts or examples about use of mobile telephones uh, to push messages out and to communicate on that platform? And that's for you or Jerry. Uh, so this is Lauren. Um, I, I think some of that is, you know, some of these texting, you know, support services that I mentioned, some of them were tailored and some of them were more general. I think there is some research on a platform such as things like Text for Baby where, you know, you sign up and you sort of get push notifications. Um, 
but I, I don't know as much about that research. The other thing I'll just mention before turning it to Jerry is that I do know that prior to COVID, there were uh, programs serving in remote areas where particularly the uh, uh, providers were more, you know, disconnected. Um, it might be sort of, you know, one provider um, um, on their own. That that things like Facebook groups and other um, those kinds of platforms all also, you know, sort of telehuman services and how the workforce could be supported. And so, how do we leverage those kinds of platforms as well? Okay, that's great, Jerry. Do you have any thoughts about mobile technology or proactive communication? Um, yes, um, actually, uh, the program uh, that um, that I run for Ohio, uh, the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program, is for 14 to 24 year olds, and so we have been um, for quite some time encouraging our local agencies to use uh, mobile phones in connecting with clients, um, particularly uh, things like texting, um, also direct messaging on social media platforms. Um, the one challenge we have, of course, is privacy and trying to ensure that they're not sharing um, protected, personally identifiable information on any platform that's not encrypted. Um, so we have found that texting has actually been a very mm -hmm. effective way to stay engaged, keep folks engaged in the program. And so um, not every county is using mobile technology, but many of them are. That, that's great. I think it has a ton of potential. And to get to that question of confidentiality, we had a question come in about uh, an experience using, I think, video uh, and screenshots, and it was difficult and couldn't, maybe couldn't be done because they couldn't assure confidentiality. And they want, the questioner wanted to know if a signed disclosure statement or a permission statement, which I've always tried to use personally, uh, would be helpful. Have you guys got thoughts or comments about how to protect confidentiality in a more open platform environment? Jerry, do you have uh, immediate thoughts? So we have shared a few platforms that we, you know, that we know um, at least advertise that they have encrypted technology in use. I am not sure about the screenshot issue. I don't know that we've been using as much video conferencing before COVID-19. Um, but I, I would think that that would be something that we'd, we'd want um, some guidance on from uh, our federal partners um, and it's something to definitely research further. Yeah, and one thing I'll just add is that I, I, uh, I heard a presentation around sort of virtual screening for intimate partner violence and um, it didn't you know, recognize the fact that control of electronic devices and texting and those sorts of things may occur with abusers. And so being really clear that uh, not only like are they within, you know, listening range, but is there are there inf is there information being communicated that that could actually put someone in harm and being very careful about that. Um, and then the other thing I'll just mention is a lot of programs have really started shifting to the need of things like DocuSign and um, to, to get consent. I don't think it you know, will right. necessarily fully address these issues, but um, I did want to mention that. I, I think that's good. I, and, and so I think it's so much potential to do things differently like this. Um, Another question we've got, and I'm, and I'm going to try to at least frame the question a little bit more, is do we feel that the lack of in-person case management loses certain intangible measures uh, or engagement? And I, and I actually think this is a really important question that I wish I more thoroughly knew the answer to. I think we're all trying to move towards the use of motivational interviewing and building the kind of rapport with the knowledge of uh, poverty and the impact of toxic stress and what that does to executive function. So in a virtual environment, and I was very intrigued, Lauren, that the outcomes and the impact uh, seem to be very similar or better. Uh, do you, either of you have any thoughts about how to uh, use a higher level of rapport building with customers to gain their trust so that all of the work we're doing in human services is really at the end of the day, their work, their plan, their attempt to move down a more po a more impactful road around what I will call economic mobility or other outcomes. So um, I don't, you know, I, as I mentioned, the literature uh, and the research is very 
thin in this area. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll mention is that, you know, it really goes back to that, you know, what I was mentioning about sort of core components and thinking about sort of what does it really take to, say, build rapport with someone, and then how could you do that in a virtual environment? Um, so are there, are there things such as, you know, just the simple things of eye contact, shared, you know, affect, you know, building trust, those are things that you can do in any platform, but I think it is really going to be requiring a, an intentionality to supervisors and um, providers to think about how to do that and how to do that well, given that you don't have the in-person subtle cues that you might be, might be typical um, in an a in-person visit. Okay, that's, yeah, and it obviously has to be training and skill implications, and I think you made a comment about uh, what we know and don't know about the real skill sets are needed to work uh, and build these relationships virtually, and so there's obviously attention to be paid there. What if, another question has come in, what if the family home visitor doesn't have the capacity to do video and can only do telephone or text visits, quote, unquote, uh, any research on just the limitations of something, and I know from my work in a couple of states, uh, we obviously don't have web access everywhere we would like to have it. Sure, yeah. Um, well, so I will say that there are some home visiting programs I, I know in California in which the provider is actually going out to the family, um, being near their building and using their own um, phone as a hotspot to allow people to connect um, in, you know, in case that sort of it's the bandwidth issue that may be um, uh, preventing video. But I do think, you know, the research that I was uh, looking at would find that um, the combination of the, whether it's online information or even sort of I know some home visiting programs are dropping packets of information off at a family and then doing a phone, um, you know, support or the texting support, that the research does suggest that that actually, that can be as effective. Um, um, again, you know, we don't know a lot, but that, that gives me hope that it's about really sort of a combination of modalities and going back to sort of what does a quality service look like versus saying it has to be video or not. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. I'm going to turn to Jerry in just a second. I've got uh, a couple observations, Jerry, as we, as we move into this section. And, and I even was pleased, Lauren, to see in your presentation the word assess. Obviously, with COVID-19 and everyone trying to scramble just how to do the, the core businesses, I think a number of us are very concerned about the comprehensive kind of needs that are likely to emerge. We know that vulnerable families are going to be the first and worst hit in this environment, and they're going to be the last to recover, both in terms of employment and in terms of long-term needs. So uh, I, I don't totally know, but I think that you know, some ability virtually to assess and triage needs and be able to refer people to services uh, over time in this environment is really, really important. And I, I suspect that communities are thinking about this some, but it probably are all over the place in terms of how well this can be done as they just try to conduct their mainline services. So that's one point maybe we can, we can discuss. And then I also hope we get into a question of capacity. Um, states and counties particularly uh, have very, very different capacity to increase their ability to provide these services. There's obviously a surge going on in terms of need. I know that in um, the recession time and from 2002 to 2012 with, with Medicaid increasing by 40 percent, even in non-Medicaid expansion states, the increased federal reimbursement rate for local staffing is, is routine as that may seem, made a big difference in some states because then it wasn't all on the state or all on a county to try to find matching chairs. And maybe we can talk about resources and capacity as well. I, I, I think this all does, in the end, boil down to capacity and ability to provide some equitable playing field for people's needs. And I think there's a critically important role for the federal government to think about in that regard. Um, and so, Jerry, I'm going to turn this over to you. You're actually working <laughs> on a daily basis with all of these issues, and I'm really looking forward to, to your comments. Thanks, Joe. Um, so in, in Ohio, um, I, as I mentioned, I run the Comprehensive Case Management and Employment Program, and uh, we were not working remotely um, until um, uh, March 13th, the uh, announcement came down that state workers were going to be working remotely. Um, and the majority of us left that afternoon and have been working remotely ever since. 
Uh, so it has been a um, challenging but very quick transition. And then in, um, also in Ohio, we are a state supervised county administered state. So um, that means that we do have a variety of um, differences from county to county in how things are um, implemented, how our program is implemented. The counties have a lot of flexibility and autonomy in how they um, decide to provide case management and um, implement the program. And um, in case you're not familiar with the program, it is designed based on the WEO Youth Program. Uh, we provide services similar, um, well not similar, the same services available under WEO Youth. Uh, but we have added in TANF funding, um, which, you know, we are braiding those two funding sources together and we've tried to align um, the program as well as we can between the two funding sources. So just a little bit of information about that program. I have a poll question that I was hoping that we could ask. So how many of you, or have you worked remotely before, or did you have to make this transition for COVID-19? As I mentioned, uh, I made that transition for COVID-19. And then uh, with our county agencies, um, again, uh, those were local decisions. And uh, the time frame for them to move to remote work um, was varied. Uh, some of them still have employees in the office. Um, some of them may only be sending employees for things like mail, um, but most of them have tried to limit in-person visits for clients and have been trying to um, provide virtual case management in its place. So it looks like most people on the call have worked remotely before, so hopefully the transition was a smoother one for, for many of you uh, than probably most states and local offices. Um, as I mentioned, this is something that Ohio decided and implemented very quickly for state workers. And then um, sort of, as I, as I indicated, the timeline was different for different county agencies. But I do think that once, you know, it was all done very quickly overall, um, that's only a month and a half ago that the state of Ohio sent state workers home to work remotely. So in that time, many counties have also very quickly um, made that transition. So. The transition itself has been challenging, I think, for, for many workers. Um, you know, there's, there's always a difference in, in, in level of comfort with technology and, and learning new technology um, from worker to worker, uh, both at the state and the county level. So things like that we've been dealing with is um, many technology issues, um, learning new platforms, um, making sure that um, equipment that's needed is available. Um, making sure that staff have internet connections. We have a number of staff that you know live in rural areas um, and uh, have um, a slow internet connection if they have one. Um, thankfully, I have a pretty good internet connection at home and um, a little bit more comfortable than with technology than um, some some of my colleagues and um, uh, counties that I serve. So. Um, the other thing that we've been dealing with is um, how to supervise folks remotely. So not only do we have to move our workers to remote, but we also have to figure out how best to supervise uh, our teams remotely. So that has um, trans that transition has involved a, a lot more meetings. Uh, they are online and, and virtual meetings, but um, definitely more frequent than they have been in the past. Um, and other things with the remote meetings, things to look for um, and think about uh, that we have found anyway is that it's important to stay in touch with staff and um, really try and make a personal connection with every meeting. Uh, since we're not in the office uh, together anymore, I really have been trying, particularly with my team and even when I talk to our county partners, to try and make that personal connection either um, you know, with video conferences and or checking in with them to see how they're doing uh, with the COVID-19 changes and, and asking probably some more personal life questions than I normally would. Uh, and I think that's, that's definitely helped. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, my agency was lucky in that we had a few months before COVID-19 
um, became an issue. We had just started rolling out Microsoft Teams agency-wide, and we were including our um, county partners in that rollout. So, um, and if you're not familiar with that, that's a, another online collaboration tool that um, you can use for video conferencing. Meetings, live events, training, you can record um, training on it. You can also collaborate on documents and, and chat back and forth on issues and, and create um, different uh, what they call channels, but you know, different areas to organize your work. And um, I hadn't had anything but one training on Microsoft Teams before we started working remotely. Uh, I have to say that I'm, I'm so, so glad that we happen to have that book platform available um, at, at our agency, and it's really helped myself and my team uh, to stay connected, um, to work on things remotely, and it's also helped us to stay in touch with our county partners. Uh, so I think that their transition, again, has been a little bit slower than, than the state has, but they have definitely been, been succeeding and, and making the transition work for them as well. Um, one mm -hmm. of the challenges mm -hmm. we had um, at my agency, and particularly for my department, was we had a number of in-person regional trainings that were planned for this month um, as well as for June. So um, since in Ohio all mass gatherings are still um, banned, uh, we had to work quickly to try and convert those trainings that were supposed to be in-person and regional by a um, by a vendor into virtual training. So uh, there's probably three different, you know, overall trainings that we had planned to have in person that we've had to convert to virtual, which has, of course, been time consuming. It's hard to um, change plans uh, on such a short basis when uh, I think the trainings were already uh, developed to be in person. But, um, but I still think, um, that these trainings will be valuable. And what we've worked to do since they were supposed to be one-day trainings in person, we've worked to create a series of video um, recordings to replace those trainings. So those are just some of the immediate uh, challenges that we faced in, in switching to a remote um, effort for the program. Um, Jerry, can I ask you a question? Sure. So you, you've definitely talked about human needs in this, and I think that's important to acknowledge. How are you balancing that with the need to continue to remain productive? We talked about measurement a minute ago. But how Are you seeing productivity uh, falling? How do you maintain that balance that's a little different than in the uh, normal work and office environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I've seen productivity fall. Um, I would say that uh, occasionally it is challenging to um, complete as many deliverables as we need only because there's more meetings than we were um, scheduling before. Uh, so the meetings do take a little bit of time out of the workday, um, more so than we had in the past. Um, I do think if we continued working remotely, those meetings would probably be less frequent and less of um, would have less of an impact on productivity. Overall, I do think productivity has been um, almost the same, and um, I think the reason for that is that we were able to quickly transition to using and relying on Microsoft Teams. I know that there's other platforms out there. Uh, Google has some something similar, um, but I, I have to say, personally, I'm pretty sold on Microsoft Teams. Um, maybe it's because I've become so so familiar with it so quickly, uh, but I do feel like it's really helped our productivity so much. And it's really right. also helped with, um, you know, we can work on documents together at the same time, uh, so there's no version control issues. Um, and. Um, I am. I honestly, I I know that I will continue to use it, even if we, um, you know, be, stop working remotely. I do plan to continue using Teams. I feel that it's really helped with our productivity. Well, in the same thing, are you seeing any difference in in counties in terms of their ability to obtain this technology and use it? And a question did come in around this, particularly in rural areas or tribal areas. 
et cetera. I know from my experience in a county administered system, all counties aren't able or even sometimes willing to be able to invest in these kinds of technologies. Yes, that's a great point, Joe. So we do have um, a difference um, from county to county in comfort level with technology overall, um, and then also um, willingness um, to use uh, different, you know, different platforms and, and maybe just a lack of resources um, for training. They, maybe they don't have anyone that's already familiar. Um, but I think that, you know, at the state, we're trying to share as much information as we can to try and help counties make that transition. transition. Um, some of them have done very well. Um, I think that uh, the rural, um, the smaller counties generally are the ones that are probably struggling a little bit more with it and have relied more on in-person interactions um, and have a greater comfort level with that. Uh, but we're working with counties to try and help them make the transition. And, and some of them are using even other platforms. I know that some counties um, are using things like uh, Facebook Live to do workshops that they would normally do in person. Others are using Zoom. Um, some are using Microsoft Teams. Um, some are using Skype. Uh, so there are a lot of different platforms and opportunities out there for counties. I know today we're on Adobe Connect, um, which I, I think is great. Um, I like this product. I've also used GoToWebinar for training statewide and also to provide technical assistance to counties on occasion. Uh, but that's a great point, Joe. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the other thing is um, that we've been dealing with at the state and also working with counties is not all of the state's program systems were available online. And so, um, so our agency had to make some uh, fast moves, shall we say, to get uh, state workers and also um, county agencies when appropriate access to those systems online. So, um, so I have to say I think our, our IT team has done a tremendous job making that happen quickly. Uh, while still protecting the information in those systems. So we're entering through, for, for, for all of our systems, we're kind of entering in through a, um, a secure portal to access them all. And um, so still protecting the, um, the privacy and, and the important um, personal information of our clients, but we were able to get everyone access to the systems that they need. So that happened within a few weeks, so I think pretty impressive for this state team there. Um, I'd like to move on to another poll question. So this topic brings up something else that many county and state staff members, I'm sure federal workers are dealing with as well. Are you working remotely while also caring for children? Um, so let's see what people say. Um, I know uh, myself, uh, thankfully my children are uh, in high school, so they, they're pretty good at taking care of themselves overall. Um, I, I know that we do have some staff that have young children at home or infants, and they're, they're not able to um, access daycare at this point in time. So it is really a challenge uh, for many workers that are now working remotely to care for children. It looks like most folks on the phone are not caring for children at home. Um, but um, about 30, 32, 31 percent are, 33% it looks like now, maybe a little higher. Oh, got some last minute votes coming in. Um, but about a third of you, it looks like, are caring for children at home at the same time, uh, which is a challenge with schools being closed, not only trying to, you know, care for children, but also make sure that they're doing their online schoolwork um, is also a challenge. And so uh, I know that we, you know, my agency has been very, very supportive of uh, state workers and understanding that folks have kids at home and, you know, normally they wouldn't have their kids with them at work, um, but they have, you know, obviously no other options. And so we know that our county workers are in the same spot many times. And also our clients, you know, have kids at home and maybe now in the position of having to help them get their schoolwork done possibly have, you know, limited access to internet at all or equipment needed to do that. 
Uh, so that's one thing that we're we're all trying to keep in mind as well, and and remind um, our county partners too that we need to be, um, you know, thinking about what types of challenges clients are dealing with with COVID nineteen and and the stay at home orders. So that's an important issue. So Jerry, on that point, have you or Lauren, have you come across research about the potential for agencies to use more flexible hours? Well, some of this work does not have to be done during our normal office hours. Um, have agencies in general, as they've moved in this direction, provided more flexibility to staff when they work from home? I mean, I know numbers have experimented with this in all kinds of ways over the years, but this is a slightly different context for that. So I know I can you know speak for my agency. My agency's definitely allowed more flexibility. They've allowed people to modify their their flex schedules um, and and you know within a certain range of of time. I'm pretty sure counties are allowing that too. The ones that I've talked to have have talked about doing that. And I I do not know the literature on that and whether there's research on it. So I'm sorry I can't comment on that. Okay. Uh, it, it just seems like an area that is, is right for thought and flexibility. Thanks, Jerry. Continue, please. Sure. Um, okay, so I talked about the training. I think we can move on to the next slide. So as we started talking about some of the challenges that clients are facing, um, we have been trying to um, provide guidance to our, our county partners on flexibility. Uh, that we can allow um, in the program to try and make it easier for clients as well as case managers um, to enroll new folks into the program as well as do other things that may be, you know, requirements of the program as they serve people that are currently enrolled. So um, we are having um, counties accept new cases virtually. Uh, so <clears throat> things like, you know, things that were normally done with paperwork and um, you know, um, wet signatures, shall we say. Um, also, um, case managers getting needed documents to confirm eligibility. We're trying to allow as much as we can virtually. So um, if we didn't already have an application that allowed an electronic signature, we are um, allowing a verbal signature with uh, documentation of the verbal signature. Um, we are allowing um, counties a little bit more time to get needed documentation to verify eligibility um, and allowing, of course, um, electronic versions of documents um, to, be, to be sent in, again, emphasizing the importance of protecting and using encrypted um, platforms if we're sharing information that's protected, personally identifiable inter information. Um, we're also reminding uh, counties to try and, like we're doing with our own staff of the state, make that personal connection every time as a, as a priority when they are connecting with clients, um, particularly when it's virtually. Um, we're also allowing um, much more flexibility for our, our folks receiving cash assistance um, as far as completing work participation requirements. Um, you know, many of the employers that um, participants in cash cash assistance were working on for their work participation requirements are closed down or they've laid off staff. Uh, so, so clearly work participation is going to be an ongoing issue, especially with the high unemployment rate. And so we are trying as a state to offer as much flexibility as we can there. Um, and um, continuing to engage current clients. Um, so. Some of the issues there, obviously, we talked a little bit about, you know, using video conferencing, Skype, texting, um, phone calls, um, direct messaging on social media. Um, for training, uh, really, we can only do virtual right now. Um, that's the only option we have. So um, I've talked to some counties, and, and they're working with their local community colleges to see if they can expand their offerings for online training. Um, I know that there's at least one community college that's um, working with Ed2Go, um, which is an online uh, training provider, and I think that they provide training to different, um, you know, local training providers like community colleges. 
So they've been trying to expand their options and um, offerings that way. Um, another ongoing challenge is work experiences. So you know, not only do we have folks that are in work participation and, and need to do uh, work experience program hours for work participation, but in CCMP, um, as part of the CCMP program, we provide paid work experiences um, using both WIOA and TANF funds. But with the um, shutdown of so many businesses, those work experiences are very limited. Um, some clients are, you know, concerned about working even for companies that uh, do have open positions. Uh, so, so those are all considerations. We're trying to ensure that counties understand. We don't want to, you know, pressure um, participants into doing the work experiences if they if they do have concerns about their health. Um, but still, you know, hopefully finding some work experiences for clients that are interested. Um, and, and working with um, local businesses to do that. At the same time, thinking about, um, you know, we can't provide uh, subsidized wages to employers that have laid off folks. So, um, so that's a very, you know, challenging environment to work in. And work experience is a very important service uh, within our program um, with the goal of trying to get people into to a, you know, sustainable in-demand career. So. So that's going to be an ongoing challenge, I think, for many folks um, at the county level um, as well as, you know, clients. So I've talked about some of the flexibility that we've um, offered counties in, in, you know, completing program requirements. Another thing that we are um, encouraging uh, counties to do is do online assessments. Um, and they're for sort of a basic skills assessment. In the past, a lot of counties used um, TABE as the um, assessment to see, you know, sort of measure clients' uh, math and reading skills when they enter the program. Um, and that was normally done with paper, and it was a proctored assessment. So we've identified some online assessments that are available. It sounds like the TABE is also going to be available online in a proctored version. Um, so we're investigating that as an option. I think also CASIS is now going to be available online as well. Uh, so, so those are things that we're investigating so we can share with our county partners. Um, we are also extending eligibility for um, our, our clients that are served uh, through TANF funds. Um, and many of you may be familiar with the WIOA Youth Eligibility. Um, you know, once you're WIOA Youth eligible, you stay WIOA Youth eligible, even through follow-up services after you exit the program. Uh, TANF eligibility is more fluid. So um, in Ohio, TANF eligibility had only lasted six months before recertification was required, but we're extending it to what's allowed federally, which is 12 months uh, for folks that were supposed to be recertified during this time. Um, we're also sharing a lot of online resources uh, for training um, that maybe not necessarily at the occupational skills training level, but other types of training, things like job readiness, um, training on different um, software platforms, things that would be helpful to help our participants move forward um, in increasing their skills in preparation for their you know, entry into the um, labor market. We're also um, in constant contact with our local county partners uh, to try and find out what their needs are uh, and brainstorm on different options on ways that they um, can expand training offerings or um, continue serving clients. So we do definitely reach out very often and talk to our county partners about things like that. Um, We've developed some online trainings in addition to the ones that I mentioned before that we had to convert to a virtual format uh, just to try and keep counties informed about things that we have um, provided as guidance with COVID-19 and then also to share some of the um, information we've heard from counties on how they have found uh, ways to effectively serve clients uh, in a virtual way. But as I mentioned before, our greatest challenge is going to be mm -hmm. work experiences and the high unemployment rates going forward, I think. Um, moving on to the next slide. So urgent issues for federal human services. Um, I think that 
you know, just, just like we at the state have been trying to quickly get guidance down to the counties, I am certain that our federal partners have been, you know, really working hard to get guidance down to the state. Um, and I think that this, you know, particular environment has made everything seem very urgent. Um, and I know that I appreciate all the guidance we've received from our federal partners on um, things that we can be doing uh, to increase flexibility. So I definitely understand how hard they must be working on, on those issues uh, as we've been doing the same at the state level. Um, and then my recommendation is to just gather feedback from states, just like I just talked about with counties. Um, on issues that maybe haven't come up yet, uh, but again, you know, trying to turn around any guidance quickly um, helps us to do the same locally. And then if, you know, if it's possible to help states and locals leverage online technologies and platforms for things like training, engagement, and other ways to serve clients, um, we've identified a few and, and we've tried to share those locally. Um, but if there's other platforms out there and other uh, products out there that are really helpful and effective, um, yeah, sharing that to us um, at the state level would be really greatly appreciated. Um, I know that, you know, some platforms, like I said, Microsoft Teams really works for me, but other people might find themselves very comfortable and um, productive in another platform. So having as many options available and identified as possible um, for, you know, for the states to share with locals is, would be really, really great. Um, and then helping states and locals to figure out how to protect workers that really can't necessarily do all their work remotely. And I've listed a few here. Um, I know our child welfare case workers um, at the county level, um, they've been trying to do some things virtually, uh, maybe visits and things like that. But, um, you know, if there's a case they have to investigate, I don't think that's it has, it's not really an option to do that on a remote basis. Um, so healthcare sometimes, I guess, can be done through telehealth, as Lauren mentioned. Uh, I think that's, you know, whenever possible, that's great. I know that sometimes it's not possible. Um, so ideas on that and, and how to help us, you know, help counties protect their workers in these types of situations would be, you know, greatly appreciated, as I mentioned. Um, some of the other things that we're doing here in Ohio is um, for foster youth. I know that um, the administration has extended um, support for foster youth that would be turning 18 uh, during this time, and also for our foster youth that are in our um, extended assistance program, which is called Bridges, um, helps them, I think, through age 21, so that, you know, they're not going to have to leave where they're currently living and try and find um, employment and a place to stay and be able to support themselves. So um, I think that's a key issue to think about. Um, one of the things that I think I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but um, data, data sharing and protection of personally identifiable information is a, is a key issue. Uh, I think going forward, I think um, helping uh, the states with this issue could increase um, interagency collaboration um, between programs and agencies. So I think that will be an ongoing issue uh, in the future. And just always thinking about protecting that personally identifiable information is that is an ongoing challenge with data sharing. Um, Ohio, I don't know if you've heard, has a plan for reopening and uh, in stages. Um, so. Even as those businesses in Ohio reopen, um, I think that, you know, we may find that some staff that work for the businesses um, may not return, and, and that could be for any number of reasons. Um, things like they may have gotten another job um, that they prefer, maybe it pays more. Uh, they may have still have child care issues um, with the schools and daycares closed, um, or they may decide that financially, uh, they need to maintain their unemployment benefits at this point in time. So, so I think those are challenges as we work towards getting our our clients um, employed and into careers. It's going to be quite um, quite a challenge as as businesses try and figure out you know how many positions they need to hire for, 
Um, hopefully, many of the businesses are able to reopen. Those, I think, are unknown factors. Um, so let me move on to the next slide. Other issues at the federal level, I think, um, as mentioned, high unemployment a uh, number of times, that'll definitely be an ongoing mm -hmm. challenge, particularly for things like my program with work experience, paid work experience, um, on-the-job training agreements, um, even apprenticeship could be a challenge. And then also on the TANF side with work participation requirements, um, having that high unemployment is going to be an ongoing challenge. And uh, just trying to find placements where, where there are not um, employees that were laid off. And then uh, we're still not sure when childcare will be available. So again, that will be an ongoing issue. I think I have another polling question, if um, we can bring that one up. So um, this one is, how are you adjusting to using new technologies uh, involved in your remote work? So it looks like give it another minute, but it looks like most of you are doing very well. And you, um, as we saw in one of our prior polling questions, many of you were already working remotely. So hopefully we're already familiar with many of the um, technologies to use for remote work. Um, I think uh, many of the you know, state staff as well as county staff are still struggling to get used to many of those new technologies. Um, uh, at the county level, though, um, I do think, as I mentioned previously, uh, many of the counties are already using mobile technology. So, um, so texting, things like that, they're familiar with. But when it comes to things like Zoom or other types of video conference platforms like Skype or Microsoft Teams, they're not so familiar. So, um, so I think that they are still struggling with some of the new technologies that they're working with. Um, and, and that's just something to remember as you work with the states and local um, that many of them are just just starting to uh, to learn how to use these new technologies. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide. So, serving um, clients virtually instead of in person, things to think about for success. Uh, I think with training, it depends on you know the training type. What type of topic are you covering? Right, some things can be covered fairly easily online. Uh, some things um, require um, in-person hours, like clinical work, or um, you know, if you're going to try and get training on how to do welding. I mean, so there's lots of different uh, things that may be a challenge to do in an online format and may not be able to be done completely online. Um, the learner, um, how comfortable are they with technology? Do they have access to the internet? Do they have a decent connection? Do they have the equipment they need? Um, lots of things to think about for that. Um, I think it's also going to be important to survey clients, uh, training providers, and other stakeholders, like for me, um, county agencies and their staff, to see how things are going um, and what challenges they may be having so we can try and figure out what we can do as a state to help them uh, be more effective. Um, I think it'll also be important, even more important now, to monitor client progress and outcomes. Um, I think that on the upside, um, using technology, sometimes it's easier to check in with clients more frequently than if you were just always scheduling an in-person meeting, uh, which I think takes more time and effort on both the client and case manager's part. Um, but, um, but I think that you know, trying to keep the clients engaged may be um, challenging for many of our case managers who may not have been doing things on a virtual basis previously. Um, and I do think there was a big gap in engagement as counties um, moved and transitioned towards remote work. So um, I think that took most of them several weeks to accomplish. Uh, the other thing to think about is uh, developing plans for challenges that you can identify, things like having kids at home to supervise and help with schoolwork, talked about that a few times. Um, and then also that, you know, online training just may not be an option uh, depending on in individual circumstances. You know, if somebody that we're serving has, you know, three or four kids, all um, elementary school age or younger or even, you know, pre-elementary school, 
they may not have a time and place where they can focus on online training. So something that may have to be put off until at least childcare is available. Um, but I do think, you know, the most important thing is to really just check in with folks to see what's going on with them specifically, what challenges they are facing uh, during the stay at home um, time period and um, what their particular family situation is like and living situation and, and figure out what, you know, what would help um, make their current situation better. Um, and that's something that, you know, could be the focus um, at this time. And then once, you know, other types of things are available like childcare and, um, and possibly school, things like that, it might be a better time to focus on other services, things like work experiences and or training um, in the future. Um, but at this point in time, I think helping folks stabilize their lives and um, you know cope uh, with their current situation is, is the most important thing as we work with, um, with our clients. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we're now going to enter the, um, well, do you have another slide? Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. Sorry. Do I still have time? Yep, if you can go quick. Okay, I'll, I'll work quicker. <laughs> okay, um, so, um, so as I mentioned previously, it's important to check in with your staff on a personal level, uh, stay connected, make sure they're coping, okay, um, and each person's situation is different, just take that into account. Um, frequent check-ins on a professional level are helpful too, just to make sure that they don't need help with uh, remote technology. Um, you know, survey staff um, and uh, and clients to see what they need, uh, what's possible. Um, and um, I'll move on to the next slide. And then down the road, um, just you know, if for our federal partners, just thinking about how states and locals can serve clients effectively, um, particularly with case management, um, with uh, social distancing issues, um, because I think social distancing is going to be a long-term thing. Um, the level of social distancing is yet to be decided. It seems to be something that will vary from state to state so far. Um, and then, you know, helping states figure out how to work with clients effectively with the high unemployment. Um, protecting frontline human services workers, and um, also um, this, I, I, I don't know, once we do have vaccines developed, um, providing access to that for our vulnerable population. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks, Joe. That, that is really excellent. That covers a lot of uh, territory. We've got a number of questions. Uh, thank you very much. We've got uh, about 10 or 12 minutes left for question and answers, and I want to invite the audience if there are even specific ideas that you have as part of the federal government that we should be thinking about, I, I think we can probably uh, accommodate those thoughts. Um, Lauren, I've got a couple of questions for you that have come in. One is, is there any either literature or experience with the liability that might be present in a virtual environment? Um, I may have seen this in telehealth, and I've been thinking about suicide hotlines. But if people uh, during their virtual interaction may threaten to hurt themselves, they don't provide an address, someone wanted to know about that. It's a great question. Um, I honestly don't know. I, it is very possible that some of the information shared that, and I'd be happy to sort of go back and look at some of the, particularly the telehealth um, papers that might have covered it, but I don't remember it as a common theme for sure. Well, obviously, this has been an area that people have experience in and the, in different crisis services, and we probably want to avail ourselves of that. Um, a different question, which I thought was a very good question, because we did talk about flexibility. I am personally think more flexibility, if we can figure out the right structure, is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, but a question came in about how do you help people really balance that flexibility, Lauren? Uh, people are online working at midnight or beyond. How, is, is there an optimum way to structure this kind of flexibility and this kind of uh, virtual work environment? So I actually think Jerry would be a great person to answer this question. I'll just okay. share 
you know, from my own organization, you know, we, we value work-life balance. We're trying very hard to support that. And I think open communication about what people are facing as far as challenges and understanding that sometimes people are working late at night or on a weekend or very early in the morning because that's what their family needs. But the more people can communicate about that, I think, you know, just for personal experience, that's very helpful. But Jerry, I'm sure, has some ideas as well. Okay, Jerry. Yeah, I, uh, sure. I, I would say I, I think my agency has done a good job at reminding um, state workers that it's important to maintain a work-life balance. Um, they have definitely encouraged us to, you know, take breaks, mm -hmm. get outside, uh, do do some exercise outside if we can, and try and do, you know, trying to take care of ourselves. And and we um, within within my program have tried to do the same with our county partners and really emphasize uh, the importance of self-care and, um, you know, still still keeping professional boundaries to avoid burnout. So I think that's an important question. Okay. Another, another question, someone wanted to know if there were any lists or obvious lists of best practices around the required kinds of application documents and other documents one needs in terms of how they are submitted online. And this sort of gets to my interest in mobile technology. Folks are very comfortable, more than me, <laughs> of doing things online and scanning documents and using this technology. And, and generally, I'm betting a lot of folks have the have more capacity than a lot of our, than we have yet developed in, at the local level. Do you guys have any thoughts about best ways to work virtually and get information from customers? And what do you do, and Jerry, now to get that? You mentioned you're working virtually. How are you getting that documentation in? So um, uh, I think that case managers and, and counties are doing different things. Um, some counties, you know, I mentioned we're allowing online assessments. Um, some counties have preferred to mail out assessments and have um, – have clients mail them back. Um, I think that we're encouraging counties to do what works for them and the client. Um, so some clients are very comfortable, you know, taking scanning and or taking photos of things um, and, and sending them via email. Um, I, I think it just depends on what, what type of um, technology they have, what they are capable and know how to do, uh, what feel comfortable doing um, is key. And um, I know that, you know, in our office anyway, we're getting ready to replace our uh, current case management system, and I'm looking forward to and hoping we can incorporate those types of technologies in the new system. Okay. Lauren, any thoughts about that at all, or what? how does the information get into the telehealth world? Uh, so I think many question. of the themes... Well, many of the themes that Jerry's already touched on are relevant about sort of selecting platforms that we know are secure and encrypted and, you know, providing best practices. I mean, we use in the research uh, space, we use a lot of these technologies already to do uh, remote data collection. And so there are lots of op options that can be used uh, and borrowed from either research or other uh, similar uh, service delivery uh, environments, but I think it's important um, if if someone doesn't know what they're looking for in the technology, you know, uh, the more we can provide support to states and to counties on where to go for information on how to pick the best platform, that would be really helpful because it's a very confusing and complex and changing environment. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch slightly. I think we have a couple of questions that are in comments that are uh, maybe a, a more, I would call them a little bit more long-term and strategic as we move forward. Um, how do you, you guys have any thoughts about how the federal government can more, I guess, comprehensively help address the digital divide? I know that's an issue that's been around for some time. There's been significant efforts in that regard. I also know that some states have have got big pockets of areas that this is going to be a challenge. Does, does any uh, any thoughts, Lauren, about capacity and digital divide as you as you as you look at how telehealth approached this? 
So, I, I mean, I do think it's, it's a big issue. Um, you know, I know there were efforts when I was in the government on improving connectivity for remote and rural communities, and um, I think the, the current situation has just um, raised up in even more stark contrast the disparities we face in this country um, around lots of things, but technology being one of them. Um, the, the one, um, the one piece of research I saw, particularly was this was on telehealth in Alaska, um, talked about communities actually, um, you know, joining together across health and human services in order to figure out the technology infrastructure to allow their communities to access these resources because they saw the value and importance. But um, my guess is, is that that was a, a long haul and it took them a while. And so, you know, what can we do in the near term and what really are we looking at in the long term? Um, and I think, you know, we're both addressing what's right in front of us, but I do think we need to start thinking about long term and, and that these options are probably not going away. So how do we um, how do we continue to support those communities in the future as well? Okay, excellent. Um, and speaking of capacity, someone asked the question, how do you suggest increasing technical knowledge to the aging population? I find that a personally relevant uh, question. Uh, fast growing population, but may not feel as savvy. And, and, and frankly, there's a lot going on in the aging population right now relative to guardianship and adult protective services all across the country in this environment. Um, any thoughts about helping folks become more comfortable with this? This is not my area of uh, study for the most part. I will tell you I heard out of the state of Connecticut and Child Welfare Services that some of their grandparents who are uh, caring for their grandchildren have actually really appreciated the telehealth options because it was a, a, a way to kind of make it easier to, for them to juggle these things. So I don't know if it's a blanket statement that all of the more aging population needs support. They might actually like this option. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any studies about utilization in quote unquote aging population? I'm not either, and I think that would be an interesting place to inquire. We know that there are communities and in, in impoverished areas left behind with technology, which creates inequity. And actually, I probably haven't put much thought personally into this for the aging population, but it's obviously a good area to, to look at. Um, I have two more questions, and in, 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 in a way, they're related. Uh, what do you guys think, in terms of what's being tried now, is likely to stay in place after COVID-19 goes away? So I can speak from the home visiting space. I'm sorry, Jerry. You want to go ahead first? No, you go ahead, Lauren. So in the home visiting space, people were dipping their toe in this water for a little while, and that's where some of the research I spoke from came from. Um, and what we have been talking about is that this has opened the floodgates, and it is very unlikely that the field will go back to solely in-person service delivery. Um, and that's really where, for me, the question of sort of what, who does this work for, for whom and what circumstances is the best option, um, rather than thinking that once the COVID crisis is over, we're all going back to services as usual. Right. Jerry? Um, well, I do think that, you know, the silver lining here is that both our case managers and our clients are going to be more familiar, more comfortable with technology. And my goal is to have case managers continue to take advantage of virtual um, visits as an option because I think they can, you know, be um, be done more efficiently and, and possibly more effectively uh, than always, you know, focusing on an in-person visit and would allow for more frequent engagement. Okay, excellent. Um, so the last question that I have, and this to me in some ways is a threshold question, what do you guys suggest what are the, if you each had to say what are the two most important innovations or roles the federal government could play right now to support virtual case management, uh, short term and long term, you know, what would they be? And kind of related to that, it certainly strikes me that this virtual case management capacity, at least in local communities, is not just a creature of any one particular program. So I'm particularly interested as you see, if you see this as a collaborative effort across agencies in health and human services to help 
think about local capacity. We're obviously entering a brand new era of service delivery. And like many things, the federal government has a very critical role in providing leadership and thought to this. What do you guys think? I would think that um, the federal government could really help uh, the states with, um, you know, determining things like um, which platforms meet encryption standards um, and, um, and helping states to, um, to maybe figure out um, which types of um, interactions are effective. Um, I think further evaluation would be helpful uh, and, um, you know, helping states to identify how to most effectively um, do virtual case management uh, through things like evaluations and um, technical assistance. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't, as the researcher, I couldn't agree more with a call for more research. Um, but I, and I think, it, you know, it goes back to my slide too of like, what can, what data can we collect now to really understand this? And then what do we need to uh, do going forward to actually maybe, you know, so now it's sort of describing and identifying what are the successes and challenges and then figuring out how to actually test those in impact trials to figure out which ones, you know, are more or less effective or equally as effective as in person. Um, I think would be really important. And then I think providing that sort of flexibility, um, obviously they have flexibility now, but in the future, what kinds of flexibilities could we use to, to do that, whether that's waivers or some other um, ways to, to allow people to continue to explore this as an efficient, effective service delivery mode? Um, that All of that sounds tremendous. I, I personally am a big fan of learning laboratories and innovation and academies and other ways for folks to learn from one another, and I hope that that will be a rich area of inquiry in the future. Um, I, I want to thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Jerry, uh, and Jennifer, and Aspie for allowing uh, this event to take place, and, and, and personally for me to play a very small role in it. I think it's been an outstanding conversation. 